for his tireless dedication, time, and great effort to making the University Rover Challenge an international stellar competition. Thank you very much, Lucinda. And uh, I, are you expecting a speech of some sort now, perhaps for the next hour? Yes, thank you. That All right. Good. Well, I guess that's a wonderful lead in. Uh, thank you. Uh, last night, we had a chance to honor uh, Oregon State here, and they're going to be joining me for the second half of this. Uh, the 2010 University Rover Challenge, sponsor, sponsored by TASC. As Lucinda said, this was our fourth year. It's really a great year. Uh, some background for those of you that aren't familiar with URC. Uh, it's an extension of the Mars, Society, Mars, De Mars Society's Mars Desert Research Station, located in Hanksville, Utah. Uh, there's been a tremendous amount of invaluable research that's been done there about a lot of the human factors uh, associated with Mars exploration. And a number of the crews, uh, some crews I was on uh, back in season three and five. Uh, we're focusing on how astronauts are going to work with rovers in the field. Uh, it's kind of one of the age-old questions of do we go with the human approach to exploration or the robotic approach to exploration. And I, I think as time has progressed, uh, we've seen that mindset shift and we realize that right now robots are there and doing absolutely tremendous work. But when astronauts go, the astronauts are going to have a lot of requirements on their hands. There are going to be a lot of demands on their time, uh, physical demands as well, in addition to all the science tasking. So th this is an area where robots can really come in handy and actually work alongside the, uh, the astronauts to, to provide uh, some great benefits and make their lives a little bit easier. That was really the origin of the University Rover Challenge. Uh, and with that, realize that there is an unbelievable wealth of talent uh, with university students, even with undergraduates all the way up through graduates and uh, doctoral students, uh, working on some just absolutely amazing thing. Uh, robotics industry is in a very exciting place and has been for a while now. And so there are a lot of great opportunities afforded. So URC, we're really trying to, to build on that, and uh, we've been able to see some pretty exciting things. Those of you, were, those of you that were at the 2006 convention renounced uh, URC for the first time as a program to engage ambitious students in ambitious research. So not just taking an extension of a textbook, but putting students probably in situations that they don't have a lot of experience, working at the systems level, forming teams, and actually operating uh, in, full organizations, dealing with a lot of organizational management issues. So a lot of things that we've tried to instill in URC. So it's not just applying equations or buying parts off the, the shelf that are ready to fly. Uh, trying to really stress, stretch the minds of the engineering and science students. So the challenge, I th think as I've uh, already alluded to, is to uh, design and build the next generation of Mars rovers to work alongside the future astronauts. And of course, we know the prize by now. Uh, glad to have Oregon State here, and perhaps the biggest thing of all, the year's worth of bragging rights. The 2010 University Rover Challenge, it was our largest field to date. Uh, we had teams from four countries on two continents, uh, seven teams from the U.S., two from Canada, two from Poland, one from Italy. And I, I do have to give a shout out here to the Polish teams and really the Polish chapter of the Mars Society. They have gotten incredibly excited about this and Poland in general, apparently if you're a college student working on robotics in Poland, you are the equivalent of a rock star, almost at a Bono-like stature. They, these guys get unbelievable publicity. And actually, last year in 2009, we had our uh, first Polish team enter, the Warsaw University of Technology. And last summer, it was actually Lucinda was at the European Convention and met some of the, uh, the Polish Mars Society members out there, and they uh, pointed out to her a news clip from uh, the official Polish national news network, uh, you know, the version of CNN. They were doing a special around the 40th anniversary of Apollo. And this 30 minute long special, it started off the first half was you know, everything about what happened 40 years ago, everything that was great about Apollo. The second half was their URC team and showing the clips of them out in the field and interviewing the students. So to realize that they had reached that level uh, of notoriety in Poland was truly astounding. Uh, it's really a great achievement of this competition, I think. Now these are the teams that were started working on it, but of course the hardest part of URC is working 
throughout the academic year, you have tight deadlines, you're dealing with heavy course loads. Remember, these are ambitious students, so they don't take anything easy on themselves. Uh, just making it out there is the hard part. Seven of these teams were able to make it out there. We see a little bit of attrition every year. It's to be expected. Uh, but these seven were strong enough to survive and make it out into the field. And th this team right here, you'll see me referring to them later as the Magma team. They were a pair of universities from Poland that were working together. So URC 2010 took place in early June. There were four tasks that the teams were up against, and I'll talk about them little, in a little more detail. Uh, the equipment servicing task, site survey task, sample return task, and an emergency navigation task. Uh, bottom one, perhaps better known as the astronaut rescue mission, which is, I think, always my personal favorite every year. But of course, first, you have to weigh in. You can see a few of the rovers here as they're getting ready for their weigh-ins. Uh, Iowa State in the upper left is York University right here, and the six-wheel guy right there is from the University of Waterloo. Uh, the weigh-in requirements, uh, 50 kilograms is uh, the, the cap that we set for the teams, and then they're allotted an additional 20 kilograms for additional modules. They're allowed to swap out different parts for different experiments uh, if they need a chemical sampling kit for some of the science tasks, they can swap that in and perhaps pull off an arm that might be used for construction purposes in the equipment servicing task. But most importantly, only, um, only have 50 kilograms for any given competition configuration. All the teams came in, the majority of the teams came in right under the buffer, right in between 46 and 49. 0.9999 kilograms, really trying to milk it. There were a couple of impressively light rovers. I think we're around the, uh, there were one or two that were under 40 kilograms. Uh, we had at least one team that put their rover on the scale for the very first time at the weigh-in, and their jaws kind of hit the floor, and they started figuring out, okay, which cameras are heavy and probably superfluous? Uh, how few batteries can we get by on? Will this last 40 minutes if we pull that battery? So there was some last-minute reconfiguring that had to take place. Uh, throwing out batteries and other heavy hardware, but everyone did make the cut. No, no penalties for being overweight. So let the competition begin. The equipment servicing task. For this, you can see a panel here. Teams had to navigate out to the panel. Uh, and it starts off, had to actually drive to the panel, obviously. But you can see a white sheet of paper here. And this could be a generator. It can be anything out in the field that breaks down. And instead of waiting for an astronaut in the HAB to go through the long process of putting on the spacesuit, going through the airlock, depressurizing, going out and working through this, if you have a rover that's already sitting on side, you have it on remote control, you fire it up and run it out. But every equipment, piece of equipment is different. Sometimes you have to look up the instructions. Sometimes the instructions are literally just taped to the panel. So you have to go out there. You have to actually be able to use your rover to read the instructions and figure out what procedure you need to go through. Now you can't quite see it on here, but there are a number of switches, just standard light switches, uh, the toggle switches, a couple of rocker button switches. There's a button in here. And also uh, a series, these dangling wires here, power cords that the teams have to grasp and actually plug back in. There's a sequence here. They're all labeled with what they had to do. Uh, teams had to work their way through. It's actually an incredibly challenging task, especially when you get to inserting the plug. Uh, this was something I knew was going to be a stretch goal for the teams. And in my opinion, uh, you know, I go to a lot of robotics conferences. I really try to follow what the state of the art is. This is really at the absolute cutting edge of robotics, of what you're able to do. So you can see Iowa State's run here, getting ready to, to go out into the field. And there, there's their rover heading out. And they, you see they have a pretty interesting two-track design there with uh, independent suspensions. And you can see the panel out in the distance there that they have to drive to. But of course, I mentioned just getting to the panel is hard. Now, you can get close to the panel, but then everything has to be working just right. Or with Iowa State here, they had, oh, I believe I paused it. Now, this is at either 4 or 8x speed, but they had some trouble. They were driving around. Motor controllers were sticking. They ended up doing some circles, spinning around, doing some donuts. Uh, Every time this happened, they would lose the panel from their field of view. Keep in mind, they're looking first person through one of those cameras up on the mast there. So they're trying to track where the panel is as they're uh, spinning in all these circles. Finally, they get it back in sight, able to get, make their way over to the panel. That's the first part of the task. 
Iowa State, they, they were out there ready to do some great work. And they line up. And the second video here, you can see something interesting start to happen. And this is sped up a little bit. They're getting lined up here, starting to read things. And it starts subtly, but in a second here, there it is. You see their arms start to get a bad case of the shakes. And they're going to get worse and worse. And I was standing right behind this when, when this happened, as was their advisor. And those were violent shakes. Uh, we were really starting to expect everything to fall apart. And there's a quick rapid flail. Start shaking even harder. And wait for it. And there it goes. And about five seconds after that, their advisor and I started to sniff. That smells like burning silicon. There's smoke coming out of the rover. Yep, they burned out a mo their arms motor controller. And when I say burned out, there was smoke pouring out from inside the case. Exactly. So we're going to move on here to York University. York University are defending champions from 2009. They had an incredible rover uh, last year's competition. This year they had another great rover. See it out here working in the field. And this, is, this video takes about four minutes. I'll try to walk you through it. This shows almost the entire, entirety of uh, the task for them. And again, this is sped up. It's a little jerky early on. I apologize for that. We can see it making their way out here. Now, the team member that's standing behind, she's not actually controlling anything or relaying anything out. We allow teams to have uh, someone follow for emergency cases. If the rover actually catches on fire or something goes catastrophically wrong, there's a big red button that you can see right there that she can slap in. That's the master kill switch. So we allow them to have, have that for contingency purposes. Now, as the rover starts to operate here, I'm going to point out they use a Cartesian coordinate system arm here. Everything operates on linear axes. The whole stack can slide right to left on the front of the rover. You can see right here with their uh, power screw uh, sliding up and down. Uh, the Cartesian coordinate arms are... They can be a lot easier to operate. They don't allow you some of the configurations that a traditional uh, angular spherical coordinate system arm similar to a human arm can offer you, but they, they become a lot easier to implement, a lot easier to operate. And so you can see here, they start working their way through the switches. They toggle them. They had to toggle them on and off. Uh, there was a little bit of confusion about they toggling them on, off, on, off, on, how many times. Uh, but all the teams were able to, to get through this pretty well. And this, this whole series here happened, takes place over the course of about 32 minutes. Uh, they, they didn't get off to a clean start right at the beginning. They were still scrambling when the clock started to work out the last couple bugs in the code, making sure all the connections are in place. That's one of the things that actually hinders a lot of teams when uh, they get everything out in the field, all these moving parts, once you get these complex motion patterns taking place, a lot of times the rovers will actually disconnect their own wires. Something gets caught up on a thread, turn your arm the wrong way, and all of a sudden, pop, there goes a camera. Or pop, there goes a battery. Uh, so some pretty difficult teams have to be careful of. York University, you see